Welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. For this episode, we are going to cover some of the really great one-of-one one cars coming to Arm Sotheby's Arizona auction here in a few weeks. Uh, specifically, this Corvette ZL1, which is a really incredible car. I feel pretty honored because I'm able to talk to the original owner of this car that bought it back in 1969, along with Greg Porter, one of the car specialists for RM Sotheby's. Now, before we get to that, I do need to cover a few things up front. If you are able to join us for my first Guest the Hammer live streaming event, let me apologize. I did have all sorts of issues. I had sound, I had video, uh, timing issues, but all in all, it was a lot of fun. Uh, go to my YouTube channel and you can see it. And uh, there's a lot of folks commenting on it. Uh, we had, I don't know, 65 people in the room or so. Uh, it was a lot of fun at the Moto Car Club. Thanks to Todd for hosting this event. We'll have another one coming up on April the 1st. So if you're in the Cincinnati area, please join us. If not, you can join online and win prizes by phantom bidding, putting your best guess out there as far as what these cars are going to sell for. Folks seem to really have a good time, both in person as well as online. So please join us again on April the 1st. All right, next, uh, I wanted to talk about this ZL1. So I wanted to kind of review the hierarchy of engines when it comes to the Corvette. So uh, for the 1960s, uh, you have basically the C2 Corvette that goes from 1963 to 1967, and the C3 Corvette that starts in 1968, of which this is what the ZL1 is, a 1969 car, a C3. Now, all Corvettes for this generation these two generations were powered by either a small block 327 V8 or a big block 427 cubic inch V8 for 1963 to 1969. Now, the only exception to this would be 1965, where there was a 396 cubic inch big block V8 that was kind of the precursor to the big 427. Now, the 327 small block V8 ranged in horsepower from a base of around 300 horsepower all the way up to 375 horsepower for the later fuel injected cars. Now for the 427s, there were many different options as far as number of carb setups um, and everything else that uh, the range was pretty stout, but the top spec engine that is very well known is the L88. Now that one was rated around 430 horsepower, uh, but realistically, uh, it produced closer to 550 horsepower. Now, this is the car that there's a record price uh, out there. Uh, one sold in 2014 for $3.85 million, and that was for a 1967 L88 Coupe. So that's the C2 generation Corvette, which in my mind is the most beautiful Corvette ever made, specifically 1967. Now, that's for the L88. There were just a handful of those built. I believe in 1967, there were 20. And then in 1968 and 1969, there were more. Uh, that's why that one brought such uh, a staggering amount of money. Um, so the ZL1 actually is a step above the L88, which is really insane when you really think about it. And there's only two factory ones known to exist. And this is the convertible that is coming up for sale at RM Sotheby's Amelia sale. So per motor trend, so I'm gonna quote a couple things in these articles here I found online. So per motor trend, and the big headline, uh, let's see, we'll get to those in a second. So per motor trend, for those unacquainted, the saga of the ZL1 Corvette reads like a Tom Clancy novel. The ZL1 was a mid-year engine release for the 1969 Corvette and was slated to replace the legendary L88. It boasted a beefier all-aluminum block, stouter connecting rods, and open chamber heads that flowed better than the l 88 the ZL1 was also lighter, weighing about the same as the L46 small block, and it was expensive. The ZL1 option cost just over $4,700, while the base 1969 Corvette Coupe was just a little more than that. So basically, the ZL1 option would double, more than double, the price of a base Corvette. Now, if no other options were ordered, the tab for the ZL1 Vet, because you had to get a couple other things with it as well, was a hefty $10,048.15. Radio and air conditioning were not available with the ZL1 engine. Let's see, with that nosebleed price tag, not many ZL1s were produced. All right, now this next article is from Road and Track. Their headline, 
for our particular car, which is the orange car you see now if you're joining me online on YouTube. This one-off Corvette ZL1 could bring $3 million. The one-of-one one ZL1 convertible is a Corvette collector's dream. So from road and track, GM rated the ZL1 at 430 horsepower. Now in my interview, you'll hear it's actually 425, but that's a blatant lie. Later testing revealed the open chamber version was actually good for closer to 560 horsepower, more than the L88. That made the ZL1 the most powerful engine GM had ever produced up until that point. All right, a couple more headlines that are popping around about this car. From the drive, the 69 Chevy Corvette Stingray ZL1 could be the most expensive vet ever sold. Now this next one is from the Rob Report. Chevy built only one 1969 Corvette Stingray ZL1 convertible. Now it's up for auction. I did want to make a quick note. If you're ever in Monterey for Monterey Car Week, uh, be sure to check out Reggie Jackson's collection. He actually has it open to the public. You pay like 20 bucks to get in. Super nice guy. Uh, I'm showing a picture from my Instagram feed right here where I met him uh, two years ago. And I bring that up because uh, when you go there, ask to look into his engine room because in his engine room, he actually has five ZL1 aluminum blocks back there. So being as rare as they are, you're lucky to see one ZL1 engine block, but the fact that he had five back there was just really astounding. So it's definitely worth the 20 bucks to go see Reggie's collection. He's got some really iconic muscle cars, some really nice stuff. I believe he has a ZL1 Camaro, if not two. All right, so that's it for the, uh, the setup for this interview. So let's now hear from the original owner of this ZL1. All right, so we're going to talk about a really cool car here. So we're talking about a one of one 1969 Corvette ZL1. I got some great guests here. I've got Greg Porter, who's one of the car specialists with RM Sotheby's, and then also uh, John Marge. Uh, John, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good, good. And Greg, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> well, John, you have this incredible, cool car that you owned in the past that is coming up for auction at RM Sotheby's Arizona sale. And it's my understanding that uh, you, you've had a lot of cool cars in your history, and uh, this is one of the coolest. So could you tell us a little bit about this Corvette ZL1, uh, how you came to own it? And uh, it's not something you could just buy from the factory, right? Well, it took, took some time to get it ordered. I, uh, I had a 68 L88. That, that I used to race before, and I've been friends with Don Yanko since back in the oh goodness, early 60s. And through him, I met Grady Davis from uh, Gulf Oil Corporation. Uh, we had ordered this car at the dealership that I always dealt with, and uh, the order had been rejected. Uh, one thing was for the rear end, and I think the other thing was for the automatic transmission. And I called Grady and asked him if he could help me. And I called Don first of all, and he said, "Once you call Grady, he has he has pull with General Motors." So I told Mr. Davis what was going on, and he said, "I'll take care of it." He called me a kid because I was a state policeman back in those days, and he he wrote a letter to I think it was. If I remember correctly, Joe Pike uh, had something to do with publicity or the, the newsletter that came out for the Corvettes and that. And, uh, the dealer called me sometime afterwards, so I believe it was in sometime in October, that uh, he had got word that the car was going to be produced in, in December. Where behold, it showed up at the dealership towards the end of December. So I've got to ask, why did you order this car? Because um, I'm going to go through like the hierarchy of the engines for the C2 Corvette. And, you know, typically the L88 has always been the big dog. You said you had an L88, but this is something even crazier, the ZL1. So why did you order this? And what was your connection with uh, with Yanko? Because Yanko's obviously iconic in the auto industry. Like, why were you trying to buy this? Were you drag racing it? Like, what was the goal? Well, back in the day when I was younger, um, 
I drag raced and I autocrossed with a, a club back here called the Allegheny Kiski Car Club. And I actually met Don Yanko doing that back in the 60s at uh, some of the SCCA events he was at. And I, I wasn't doing it right then. I was drag racing, but uh, I was with a gentleman uh, by the name of Harry Burns from local gentleman from from Leechburg that was in the foreign cars and he he autocrossed and he drove on the track and that and I I went to the track with him and that's where I met uh, met Don and uh, Grady Davis at and as time goes on I drag raced a good bit with what with the cars I had and then I had a I, the last one before I got the orange car was a 68L88, and it was a four-speed convertible. And a fellow from Delmont worked on it for me, you know, carburetor work and so on, and we drag raced with it, and it was a, it was a low 10-second, almost a 9-second car. But I couldn't do much better because I wasn't the best at shift, and then, of course, the the uh, the shifting mechanisms in the Corvettes weren't the best either. So sure, Don had told me he says you know that uh, they're coming out with a with an aluminum engine and uh, you can they'll put he said you can order an M40 behind it. So that's what I did. It's all history from there. I got the damn thing and uh, raced it. Took the engine out of it a few times and uh, put it in a stock car I had, and but it was really fast. And yeah, what did it pull in the what did it pull in the quarter mile? I mean, if you were doing those numbers in the L88, what did this thing do? The best this turned in a quarter mile was a 956 at 151 mile an hour. Wow. Okay. And what year would that have been in? Uh, Nineteen. Uh, I believe 71. Okay. Yep. Okay. So how many years did you have the car? And like, how, how long did it stay with you before it went on to its next owner? Uh, I believe it was in around 2007, I think, that Mr. Perone bought it. Bruce. Oh, wow. I met Bruce at a, years and years ago with his dad at a, at a uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix when I had it down, when I had the orange car down there. Yeah. Now, Greg, you mentioned that there's some other cool cars that uh, John's had in the past, like that led up to this. Is that right? Yeah, um, I thought it would be cool to, you know, have people because you told me about some other cars you, you know, starting in 63, what you ordered. And then, you know, you ordered another car and then you ordered another car because you, you, you were telling me some of the muscle car lineup that you were drag racing. And it's kind of the the. uh <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of cars that every you know serious muscle car guy is like well he had one of those and he had one of those and so can you tell us a bit about some of the some of the ones you owned before this um, yeah it, uh, the first one that i actually ordered new was a 62 chevy biscayne with a it had a late front end on it and, uh it was a 409 and i kept that a year and i sold it and got a 63 super sport 409 and at the same time my dad really liked my my car and he says it would be really nice to have a convertible like that so dad <laughs> ordered one he had a 409 with a convertible now is this a is this an impala super sport yeah yeah they were all impalas okay yep and then uh when I was on the state police, I, uh, I don't know, which I was at the time, uh, I met a, uh, a dealer from over in Trenton. He said, well, why don't you buy a car for me someday? And I said, well, if you have something that, that's pretty quick, I said, I'd buy. So I bought a 64 uh, Grand Prix with a 421 on it. And we massaged it, put a couple fours on it. Right. It was four speed. And, uh, the following year, I bought a, uh, a Corvair. I heard they were putting the tur turbochargers on a Corvair. It was a new body style, so I got, got a Corvair with a turbocharger on it. 
in the, in 66, I bought my first new Corvette and I got a 66 coupe with a uh, heavy duty 427 and a big tank. It was a 36 gallon fuel tank in it. Wow. And that year I also got my wife, her new grocery getter. Uh, she got a Chevy Malibu with a floor shift and a 427. <laughs> and then, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I didn't buy a new car in 67 because I bought two in 66. So in 68, I bought the uh, the blue L88 and I got my wife a new grocery getter. I got her a, a uh, Malibu with wood sides on it, Malibu station wagon with bucket seats, a four speed and a 427. Wow. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, 69 is when I got the, uh, the orange car and I bought her a brand new Kingswood estate station wagon with a four and a quarter. It was 427 in it. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's quite the lineup. And I'm flipping through the pictures here of the, uh, the orange Corvette, the, the, uh, ZL one. And I noticed some interesting specs on it. Obviously, we've talked about it being an automatic. And then I noticed the radio delete. Uh, so is that, let's see, is the automatic just for durability doing the launching? And is the radio, did you have to get radio delete or did you do that for uh, lightness? No, that that was a, uh, that was a, you had to get the radio delete to be able to, to get the, to get the engine. That, the same was, 68 was the same. Um, the 66 had 66 had a radio delete and no heater, but with the uh, advent of the government sticking their nose into everything, 68 they made them put the the heater in because of the uh, windshield, I guess, fogging and that, you know. In the 69, the only the reason I got the the automatic is because I wasn't that good at shifting, and <laughs> uh, of course, Just, yeah. Clem Zorowski, he worked on the engine when it came in, did some fine tuning and everything on it. And I changed, uh, it came through. I mean, it was terrible when it came in. The young fellow that's here with me, he was there with, they had come off the trailer in the garage, but when it came from the factory, it only had two inch exhausts on it. And when it came wow. off the factory, I can, re I can remember the dealer putting gas in it and he says, come on, we're going to go for a ride. Well, we did, and we went up the hill out of out of town and <clears throat> up around 6,000 RPM. It just blew the two pipes apart underneath the car, and I said, oh, Christ, we blew it up already. You know, but what it did, it blew the exhaust apart. It was so restrictive. Right, right. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> GM at that time, they had offered over the parts a uh, outside exhaust, which were actually... Uh, Custom uh, headers built by custom equipment, so that's what we put on the car. And I changed the rear end ratio, and that the only thing the factory would put in was a 336. So the first rear end we put in was a 411. Sure. And uh, took it over Clem, and he massaged it, and I, I changed the torque converter and left his house with it after it was done, and started home and blew the rear end right out of it. <laughs> well, made so, it about three miles. Yeah, yeah. So incredible amount of power. Now, how you said you had it till two thousand and seven. When did you stop racing it, and then when did you restore it? Goodness, I think I blew a couple engines, and the, the last factory engine the replacement they gave me was, I believe, in seventy two. My golf. Jack Blandis at Golf Oil or Golf Research. He's, he really did the engine for me, and I put it back in the car, and I probably raced it two or three times. And, uh, parked it after that, and I never really got the car back out until a, a gentleman from uh, Greensburg that knew the car wanted to know if I still had the orange car, and I said, yeah, it's sitting in my truck garage covered up with dirt and everything, and that's it sat there from 72 probably till oh 
1990. And then that is that when the restoration started, 1990? Well, that's when I got it out and I got it running and got it back in order and I, I, I took it to... Uh, so oh, Tony, Tony got me to take it down to Carlisle, and he says, "Do you know what you have?" And I said, "Yeah, it's an orange car." Or that <laughs> I didn't. It wasn't anything special to me, but I got down there, and, uh, and I I know who he is now, but I didn't at the time. Towards the end of the show on a Sunday, when everybody was getting ready to leave, this little guy came over and wanted to know who owned that orange car and i said i did he says you want to sell it and i said oh i don't know and i said uh, make me a figure and he threw a figure out and i told him well i'm really not interested at this time and, you know that's where right. it all started <laughs> yeah yeah okay the guy's name was kevin mckay by the way Oh yeah, Kevin's been on this podcast before. He helped us with the uh, Cunningham Corvette. So, oh okay, yeah, being you know, we we sold that car, and he re he ended up helping the family restore it, which is I believe still in process right now. So, uh, yeah, quite the Corvette expert. So that's great. No, it's just kind of you know kind of fascinating because, uh, you know, it's it's funny to hear you say you know well I don't I didn't really. It was an orange car. Yeah. So, because it was, you know, one of two built. And, but, you know, a lot of people don't realize the old racers or guys that had the car knew they didn't, you know, it was just a car to them, you know, just a car to you guys, but a really special car. Um, so, uh, do you remember anything else about, you know, when you, you know, um, when you ordered it of anything that, you know, Davis had to do to kind of get this thing to go through? Because, there, there's a heck of a lot of factory memos of things where, you know, this was added, you know, they had to authorize this, they had to authorize that, you know, pretty much to make sure that you got, you got what you ordered. Not really, but the only really conversation I had was when, when I asked him to write the letter. And, and I was fortunate enough back in those days. I mean, I, uh, there was a lady that, that worked for him her name was Whitlinger at the time, and, and later on, her husband had passed away, and and she remarried, and her last name was Castle then. But she, I knew her dad, and we all grew up together, and she said, you know, I I wrote a letter for you to, to General Motors for Grady. He, he wrote a letter, and she was telling me all about what the letter, you know, of Grady writing this letter. So I know that that's how the damn thing got built. Right. And for him, it would have never, never seen yeah, the light so, of day. And then you met Grady Davis through Don Yanko. And, um, yes, yeah, and and that was because of getting interested in sports car racing. And and I was I was a member of the Allegheny Kiski Car Club, and and later on I joined the Corvette Club, uh, our local Corvette Club, but. If you if you know anything about Grady Davis or Don Yanko uh, and Donna May Mims, uh, Grady had a '68 black Corvette and he parked it in a parking garage in, in Pittsburgh. And Donna May Mims saw the car parked there and she put a, a business card for the Corvette Club and Don Yanko on there and and that is how Don Yanko and Grady Davis got together, and Don Yanko drove the later drove cars for uh, Gulf Oil. And Grady Davis and, and Don Yanko, and uh, there was a Grabiac Chevrolet, and there was an, I forget the name of the other Chevrolet in Pittsburgh, but they were the originators of the Corvette Club of Western Pennsylvania, who was the oldest Corvette club in the nation. Right, right. Yeah. And the one thing I did want to mention, I don't think I mentioned it yet, but the cost of this option was basically double the price of the car, right? I mean, I think the car I saw 4600, the option was 4900. Well, it was yeah, the, just the block option itself was uh I think 3000 and you had to order you had to order the L8 or everything that was on an L88 to get it built. Yeah. Wow. 
So yeah. that wasn't uh, a, a barrier to purchase? Were you like, holy cow, is this worth it? But you just wanted to go faster, right? Well, yeah, and, and I was fortunate enough. To, actually, the day that I was at Don Yankos, I, I met two gentlemen down there. But, and, and the only reason I could really do it is because I sold, I had a buyer for the car. and There was a gentleman by the name of Andy Africa. He saw the car. I'd, I'd driven the, or the uh, blue car to Dawn's that day, and I came out, and he was standing there, and he says, what is this? And I told him. He said, I thought it was. He said, you want to sell it, kid? And I said, well, anything's for sale if the price is right. So I got $6,500 out of it. I only lost about $200 for driving <laughs> over here and beating the hell out of it. Wow. But uh I came home and I gave the dealer the 6,500. So basically, the car ran me about 3,600 dollars. Wow. Okay. Can't beat that. Yeah. No. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate your time on the Collector Car Podcast today. It'll be really exciting to see this car cross the block and what it does. I mean, from what mm -hmm. I've seen, it's, it could be a record price for a Corvette, and it's pretty cool that you know we have you on here to talk about the history of the car. I have the young fellow. He's sitting here listening to everything. He's the guy that saw it come off the trailer. Wow. It must have been a pretty memorable day with, for a car salesman. Or... <laughs> yeah. Well, he was, he was, uh, how old were you then, Frank? Oh, I was like, oh, six. I was 17. 17. Yeah, 17, 17 years old. Time. He was, he was working down there after school, washing cars. And that, yeah. And they were. Detailing cars at, at West Penn. And uh, uh, <coughs> the truck came and everybody ran out of the shop and they were unloading it, brought it in the garage. And uh, I remember looking at the window sticker on it. And I, I thought, because I had known John when he had the blue car, uh, the blue L88 car, and uh, I thought it was another LA 88 car and right until I seen the ZL1 on it. <laughs> right. On the, on the window sticker, you know. Right. Oh, that's crazy. So what do you think as a as 17 year old salesman seeing this thing come in? It's a changer. <laughs> Did yeah, you take it uh, any any donuts in the back parking lot by any chance? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, if you know where our dealer was, uh, this dealer was, he's been in business, he already had been in business since back in the uh, 1918, I think. Yeah. And it was built in the middle of the town and, you know, they weren't, they weren't very big. The dealership wasn't very big. Right. One car, one car showroom. That was it. That had to be quite the event to see this thing come in and then to hear it go down the street. Oh, that must have been incredible. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, this is this is probably because General Motors lied about their horsepower. This is for the for the government reasons. They they said it was a lot less. This is probably the most powerful car you could get. Um, well, you, you know, sixty nine, like without a doubt, you know, close to well over five hundred horsepower, real horsepower. Yeah. It was interesting back back then because they they uh, for insurance reasons they they. They rated it at 430 horse, but at the drag strip, I mean, I had a, a an advantage. Now, when you, when you think about this, we they set the classes up by horsepower to weight. So the 435 Corvettes, they were in Class A sports. The 430 Corvettes, like this thing was, was in D sports. Oh yeah. So I was racing cars, you know, begin with. I was racing in the lower class, and it, of course, it just blew everything away. But yeah, yeah. And it blew everything away in the A sports too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It was a ringer. <laughs> Thank you, GM. Yeah. It's a, an honor to talk to you, and it's an honor to see uh, Frank. So I know I've been named the one of the letters we got of you know the guy who saw it being unloaded. Um, and you know, it's one hell of a car and it's great to talk to, to you, you know, you're the first owner, um, and you know, you're, you, you're a big part of the history cause you had it for so long. So, yeah. but it's definitely a very cool piece of kit.
Yeah, it definitely one to one. That's for sure. <laughs> well, thank you, John, for joining us today. I really do appreciate your time. Anytime. I enjoy it. All right. Well, there you have it. Now, wasn't that cool? It's really great to hear from not only the original owner, but also the guy that worked at the dealership when he was 17 to talk about what it was like when that thing came off of the truck. Really, really cool. I'm so glad that we had them on. And special thanks to Greg Porter for joining me on that podcast. All right. Now, let's talk about a couple of the other one-for-ones that are at the uh, Arizona sale. This is one of my favorite ones. Now, this is the 2012 Lexus LFA. Uh, really iconic car. Um, they've been very strong in the marketplace recently. The Nürburgring edition sell typically for twice what the base car sells for. Now, this is the base car. Uh, let's see, number 75 of just 436 examples produced, presented in a one-of-one -one color combination featuring absolutely red exterior and uniquely specified full leather cabin owned exclusively by Lexus dealer principles since new. So basically that means the uh, general manager or the owner of the Lexus dealership. So it's been in carrying hands since day one. Uh, such a cool car that has really aged well. All right, now we want to go back 70 years, back to 1953. And I need you to take a look at this iconic car here. So this is a 1953 Fiat 8V Autovu by Ghia. Now this is definitely a one of one car. Let's see, unique one-off aluminum alloy coachwork uh, designed by Virgil Exner and Mario Buono, who did a lot of Ferraris as well in the 1950s. One of 15 8V chassis distributed by Ghia to Ghia, and the only one not completed as a supersonic. So if you've seen the supersonics, they're absolutely crazy looking gorgeous, 1950s Batmobile-esque looking cool cars. This is the same car, but it's with a one-off Ghia body. So really, really cool. This has been shown everywhere at the Quail, uh, at, at a Pebble Beach Concours twice. History is known from new. All sorts of documentation, books, and everything else on this amazing example. Now, a couple of these next cars I wanted to show, I just want to share them because I think they're super cool. They're not necessarily one of one, but uh, they're very rare nonetheless. So this next one is a 1950s, 52 Spanish built Pegaso. I would call this like the Spanish version of an Allard maybe or an early version of a Cobra. Little tiny V8, two door coupe, really cool looking car. Now this one is only one of 83 uh, Z102 chassis produced and one of 11 to wear this particular coachwork. Very cool, really cute little car. Just so, it's almost cartoony, the proportions on this thing. But if you ever see a Pegaso in person, uh, you'll definitely enjoy it. Definitely check it out. Very, very cool. All right, next we're going to make go into the iconic Shelby world. This thing is beautiful. This is a competition Cobra. Got to scroll down here real quick. A true triple threat. The only Cobra to feature on the Cobra Caravan in a major Hollywood movie with Elvis Presley and in period competition. So this particular picture, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the movie. Elvis movie in the background that this one was in. You can see the period pictures of the Cobra Caravan where it was joined by a GT40, one of the six Daytona coupes, and then a GT350R model. Uh, just a beautiful, it's the most iconic setup, the Shelby Blue with the white racing stripes, 427 side oiler, big block, side pipes, everything you want in a Cobra. Uh, this one has it. Um, great provenance. So it's really a one-on-one -on -one when it comes down to the provenance on the car. And then the, the last car I wanted to highlight was the 1994 Bugatti EB110 GT. Uh, very few of these. Let's see, 51st of 85 produced to GT specification. Special order two-tone leather interior. I never cared for these when these came out initially, but they have aged well. Uh, they are one of the rarest uh, analog supercars out there. It doesn't have an engine from someone else's special Bugatti bespoke engine. Really, really cool. They're really coming into their own now. Own now. Uh, so these have been hot for a number of years. So uh, not a one for one, like I said, but extremely rare, rare, extremely cool and coming up to RM Sotheby's Arizona sale. Well, that is it for this week. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for following. Thanks for sharing. And I will talk to all of you next week.